Thank you for, for joining and, and, and welcome all of you. Uh, we do have a full room, uh, which is great. We, we are meeting to, to discuss, uh, in fact, uh, a new report and the recommendations of a new report that uh, we're publishing today, which is called Towards a More Dynamic Regulation for Energy Networks. The, the, the world is changing and the world of energy is changing so fast. And uh, uh, with the, uh, the motto now for the next commission being implementation, implementation, uh, clearly uh, it's clear that implementing the regulatory agenda which has been uh, passed uh, by the outgoing commission, it's clear that this is something uh, which will require a number of adaptations. And in particular adaptation from uh, the, uh, the regulators and the way both regulators and regulatees look at uh, how to, to, to have a, a robust regulation. We, we have this report which is uh, uh, coming up today and I think the, the main lesson that uh, my colleagues in a few minutes will explain and will illustrate is that dynamic regulation is the way forward if Europe is to be serious about achieving net zero targets. And this is really uh, something which uh, needs to be developed, needs to be looked at in depth. We, we were very happy to see uh, colleagues yesterday when we, we got the, the ACER uh, paper on a, on a similar topic that many of the recommendations that they are uh, proposing uh, are already in your uh, paper. Uh, once again, say always present to uh, feed uh, regulators. And, and it's clear that uh, w what is interesting in, in uh, what we are going to listen to in a few minutes is that we see that Implementing and developing dynamic regulation is a multi-activity uh, multi objective. It, it requires uh, that you adapt the nature of planning, uncertainty mechanism, regulatory incentives, financial arrangements, stakeholder engagement, innovation processes, and uh, industry governance. So uh, we, we're very happy to share the findings, to share and discuss the findings with you uh, this afternoon. And we have uh, the whole authoring team uh, being present. Uh, Professor Michael Pollitt, Dr. Uh, uh, Daniel Dumas, and André uh, Kovatariu, uh, who are all associated uh, with, with SER. We will, they will present the paper and then we're going to have a panel discussion with uh, stakeholders from the International Energy Agency, regulatory authorities, as well as representatives from across the value chains, including TSOs, DSOs, and utilities. And in, it, it's going to end uh, with, a, uh, with a fire chat, uh, which is going to be, to be led by our new colleague, Annika Brack, who, who is here, uh, and uh, who is the new director of uh, energy, mobility, sustainability at SER. Uh, I take this opportunity also to introduce, he's sitting in the back, if he wants to, to stand up, uh, Dr. Miguel Vasquez, who's the, uh, our new uh, academic uh, coordinator. And uh, uh, many of you who are members of SER uh, will have the opportunity uh, to meet uh, with them uh, in the uh, weeks and months to come. So for the moment, I'll leave the floor to my good friend and colleague, Professor Schön Ennis, who is going to uh, introduce, well, who is going to uh, moderate the discussion after the presentation. Schön Ennis is uh, 
uh, not only a uh, board member of CER, but uh, he's also the director of the Center for Competition Policy at the uh, University of uh, Norwich. Voilà. So I'll give the floor to the authors, and I understand that we start with uh, Daniel Dumas. Daniel, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to do my best not to go over time, because um, we realized while approaching this subject, there's a huge deal of, of complexity, and we're, we're trying our best to, to, to simplify a number of things here. And um, first of all, when, when we... When we started working on this paper, we approached it with a very, very honest question. We, we, we all know uh, net zero requires change, and we know grids, the regulated part of, of, of the energy uh, sector, require change as well. But really, what really does need to change uh, in regulation? Uh, can we be more specific than that? And we, we, we approached it in, in, in several ways. Um, and it turned out to be a, a much more rewarding question than, than we, we anticipated. So these are the, the, the main research questions that we, we set out to answer. Um, first of all, how is the evolution of, uh, of uh, network regulation being impacted by net zero policies? And how is it contributing to, to, to net zero? Um, on the other hand, what are the implications of net zero um, for the main trade-offs that regulators face and uh, uh, around the, the, the net zero pathways, things like anticipatory investments uh, or biomethane or hydrogen, we, we, will, discuss, uh, we will discuss all of these things. Uh, then another question is how, regu how can regulation become more responsive? Uh, first of all, to new information that's being generated within the regulatory cycle. So not only within the, the, uh, uh, in the periods of the review, but within the periods. And also more responsive to external stakeholders, uh, such as local governments, uh, non-utility actors, and others. And of course, what is best practice? What, what is best practice in regulation for net zero? And does it differ uh, with context? And, and we think uh, it does differ, and we will uh, show how. Um, and the way we approach this is to start first at, uh, with, with, with recognizing that we need a sound explanation for why regulation needs to change. And uh, what we did uh, to confirm that indeed it does need to change is we looked at uh, a, an extremely valuable consultation process initiated by Ofgem in 2022, and the 38 responses generated as part of that consultation. And we were able to identify, based on those responses, what really is uh, uh, at stake and what's, what needs to change in the view of companies, but also other stakeholders. And we'll discuss about that. Based on, on those consultations, we came up with uh, uh, a questionnaire, a semi-structured interview guide, pretty much, that we then applied to regulators and, uh, and regulated companies. And also, we looked outside Europe and outside the energy sector. Uh, maybe there are things happening that we should, uh, we should know about and that might, uh, might be important uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our questions. And... <clears throat> we recognized and we remembered that regulation is immensely complicated, and it was immensely compli complicated even before net zero. Uh, we know what the, 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 the really difficult balancing act uh, regulators do, uh, trying to, uh, on, on one hand, uh, you know, defend the interests, interests of consumers, and nowadays consumers are more and more different. You have... Uh, 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 larger, of course, uh, industrial consumers. Uh, you have uh, um, households. Uh, there are issues of vulnerability and the cost of living crisis. Uh, on, on the other hand, you, the generators are becoming more different 
uh, you have new, new types of stakeholders that need to be listened to. Um, uh, so in, in this context, we remembered and we found in the literature that there are a number, to, well, an, a number of trade-offs that we could group along these two trilemmas, as we call them, the two regulatory trilemmas. And I'm, I'm going to try to be really brief here. Uh, the first uh, regulatory trilemma that we found in the literature is between effectiveness, responsiveness, and coherence. Effectiveness basically means the ability to get the regulated entity to adopt and implement the, those regulations without finding creative, creative adaptation and loopholes. On the other hand, responsiveness is the ability of the regulator to use their good judgment and preserve those uh, activities around the regulated entity that are not strictly according to regulation. So things that are just good and need to be preserved. Um, and finally, coherence is the ability of a regulator to, to provide predictability, ensuring that all similar situations are dealt with in a similar way. And uh, so already from 1986, they identified the fact that you cannot have all, of, all three of them. Uh, trying to improve on, on two of them will likely result in you be doing a, a worse job on, on any of the third. Um, then we found another regulatory trilemma, um, one around motivation, coordination, and, and transaction costs. Motivation, getting the regulated company to actually exert effort, to be efficient, to innovate, to think about costs today, but also costs in the future, uh, to basically do their best. On the other hand, to coordinate between the, the production possibilities, let's call them, of the network company and the preference of, of consumers, all, which also requires you having a view of, of, of risk. And finally, ensuring that all of this is done with you know, reasonable transaction costs, uh, you know, the cost of actually monitoring and implementing all, uh, all of this regulation. You, again, you can't have all, of, all, all, all three uh, of these. And net zero just adds on top of these uh, two regulatory trilemmas. And we want to recognize that. And we are going to discuss the implications uh, uh, for each. And one of the implications in our view is that uh, regulators and regulation will have to have more of these three attributes. So we, we, we kept saying dynamic regulation even in the title, but actually this word embodies more than, than just dynamism. So we, we're talking about this, uh, this new term that we, we, we think is valuable, the learning regulator because this is what these three attributes have in common. And I'm going to very briefly discuss uh, the three in turn. So dynamic regulation has two implications. Uh, on one hand, you have a, a regulator that is learning between regulatory cycles, so incorporates uh, the learning of a, of a current cycle into the regulation for the first, but also one that encourages the network company not only to be efficient and to optimize for the current uh, period in a static way, let's say, uh, focusing only on costs, but to optimize for the future state of the, of the network, which requires innovation and a little bit more risk taking. And of course, this is extremely difficult and we're going to discuss it uh, later on. Responsive regulation, uh, on the other hand, is one that tries to balance between strict reward and punishment, going to court all the time, which is a reality that many regulators and companies in, in, in this room are facing, and uh, allowing more flexibility, allowing more of the, of, of the trial and error uh, 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 allowing ideas to emerge and be implemented, even though they are not strictly regulated in terms of reward and punishment. And b basically this wisdom, this art of regulation is uh, um, captured under, responsive, uh, 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 under the responsive regulation concept. And finally, adaptive regulation is, is one that 
tries today to prepare for a number of trigger points in the future that will require uh, significant changes. And I think this is uh, extremely relevant for, for our context. We, we all know power consumption will go up. We all know EVs will go up, will, will, will be adopted. We don't know when and exactly where, but we could prepare for the times and, and, and consider a number of trigger points where change in regulation is likely to, to, to be needed from, from this, uh, from this uh, point of view even today. So this is what we believe is the, the enormous challenge that regulation is facing. Net zero adds to the existing trade-offs and to the existing complication of, of, of regulating, you know, of economic regulation of, of uh, monopoly companies. And with these three attributes, this, lear this new learning uh, regulator is what we're going to need to, to, to be able to face uh, the challenges of net zero and actually deliver uh, net zero. And um, with this in mind, um, Andre will now present the... Okay, Th this one was also mine. Yeah, a little bit of... Uh, Miscoordination, but it's it's fine. I've I'm already dreaming this content, so <laughs> it's absolutely fine. Um, so the way we we designed the the conversations we had with regulators and network companies was around these seven themes, and the seven themes and what I think uh, uh, helps a lot with the the, the validity uh, of our approach come from the consultation uh, that Ofgem initiated in 2022 and for, from the 38 responses. We were able to identify seven uh, uh, themes where regulation is likely uh, needing to change uh, to accommodate net zero, to make net zero happen. And these are planning. Um, the, the, the planning and the, uh, the uh, concept of ad adaptive regulation is really re uh, relevant here. The planning will definitely need to change. Uncertainty mechanisms, we, we mentioned that. We, we know things are changing, but we don't know when. We have to be prepared to reopen, and we have to have smooth processes to, to, to reopen regu regulatory settlements. Um, incentives will also probably need to, to, to be adapted. Speaking about anticipatory investments, we, we've, we've mentioned it uh, uh, today. Uh, financing conditions may be impacted because the risk will probably go up, and we know you still need to, to uh, provide investors with the, with the return that's commensurate with the risk they take. Um, you will have to deal with a, a larger and more diverse set of stakeholders. Uh, people who would not be involved in the conversation on energy regulation will have to be involved in it. Um, of course, you still need to do, and innovation is an, an old issue, but it, it's becoming more, more the, the stakes are, have never been higher in encouraging innovation and uh, let's say in, encouraging tolerance to, to failure in a way. And finally, uh, governance, the way you, uh, the, the system is organized, uh, having a system operator uh, in, in the transmission uh, company or not, having a, a, a better, uh, let's say, uh, a better focus on, on local level realities and also the whole system approach that needs to be ensured. These are, these are the seven key themes where the regulation is likely going to need to change and these form the structure of our conversations with, uh, uh, with regulators and uh, network companies that Andre will present. Now is your turn. <laughs> it is. Hello everyone, also from my side, thank you for being here. Uh, so Daniel managed to convey a very complicated, let's say, literature uh, into something very friendly, but I think the most rewarding part was actually the conversation that we had with, uh, uh, with the uh, entities that we interviewed for this, uh, for this process, because it was a very interesting uh, conversation and uh, also because we had a, quite a diverse group of uh, stakeholders that we interviewed. So we interviewed both uh, regulators and uh, operators 
uh, of course, DSOs and TSOs, both on the electricity side and the gas side. So that gave us a, a, a quite a, a, an interesting picture of uh, the diversity and the complexity of, of the answers. And we went, obviously, as you can see on the map, from north to south, uh, uh, east to west. Um, the average scores that, so it, the interviews also had a quantitative, let's say, uh, um, a part, and I think uh, you will be very uh, interested in, in, in the results in the next slide. And the average responses that we had, the average scores of that shows um, the interesting and the complex processes that we are about to see or we are already part of as this uh, um, energy transition is, is basically unfolding. So the results were, were quite interesting in that regard. And while, as you can see in the left-hand side of, uh, of the slide, the, the, um, uh, the graphs uh, shows, the national regulatory agencies are uh, mostly or focusing first on aspects related to incentive schemes, governance, and uncertainty mechanisms, as, as Daniel uh, has defined this. While the operators are more concerned about planning, of course, especially gas operators with, which have or which face higher uh, long-term uh, uncertainty, then financing options for investments and, uh, and, and only then incentives. At the other end, it's quite interesting that uh, while everyone was obviously acknowledging the importance of stakeholder en engagement, uh, the stakeholders I mentioned did uh, rank last in, in relative terms, of course, in these uh, these surveys. And you can see that uh, on the right hand side, with the operator scores being uh, being graphed over there. The higher the the score, the uh, the higher the importance for um, the members that we interviewed. Another rewarding part, and, and quite an interesting one, as, as Daniel was mentioning, was looking outside the, the, the geographies that uh, uh, we, most, we covered through the, uh, through the report, but also looking outside of the energy sector. And that showed some very interesting parallels, obviously limits to that, but very interesting, let's say, uh, case studies. Um, in Australia, we looked at uh, how new reg uh, has instituted an early engagement process which basically attempts to bring stakeholders, um, um, the, 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 the full spectrum of stakeholders, customers and electricity uh, network companies to agree on some regulatory uh, proposals. Somehow similar in Scotland, the uh, regulatory uh, authority for water, Scottish Water, has made uh, use of a, a consumer forum to play a significant role in the price control review process. So uh, a different way of engaging with, with consumers and stakeholders. Then we looked in Singapore and we've seen that the Singapore Autonomous Vehicle uh, Initiative has developed basically an open platform for all stakeholders, from operators to consumers, uh, users, uh, research centers, think tanks, to basically simulate or to play around uh, jointly in uh, self-driving trials, which uh, uh, offer an immense, let's say, uh, findings uh, going forward in regulating this. For the next two uh, case studies, I'll, I'll deep dive a bit because they are very interesting. Um, we looked at water regulation. Water is, once again, quite interesting in this regard when it comes to long-term planning. We looked at water regulation in England and, and, and Wales, and we've seen that of what the regulator uh, has put forward an adaptive pathways planning. Uh, and what that means is that it required, it asked from its operators, once again, natural monopolies, of course, to basically come up with business plans that are meant to cover the next five years, but need to be presented within a 25 years span, as you can see in the, in the graph. So basically emphasizing the ways each of this uh, period will be contributing to a long-term uh, goal or mission of the operator. And each company will also need to define a core pathway, as you can see in the bottom uh, part of the graph, for 25 years, this, uh, describing basically in it or encompassing in it the most likely scenario. But they also need to present with relevant indicators and, and uh, uh, triggering, let's say, alternatives that would deviate basically from this core pathway and will lead to other outcomes uh, uh, along the way. So they had to um, assign reasonable pro probabilities to that uh, as to when the threshold uh, may be reached and also based on that, what are the likely changes needed in their business plans, once again, on this long-term, let's say, strategy of 25 years. Of course, there are limits in, in comparison. Um, um, the uncertainty in the water sector is, 
is, is not the same for the energy sector with the two vectors, main vectors, of course, but uh, being a natural monopoly and having uh, regulatory cycles, uh, it brings some sort of uh, uh, lessons learned from there and some good practices. And finally, the, um, the, the second um, uh, case study that uh, we want to showcase in um, a bit more in detail today, but the, a lot more is in the report, is the case study on uh, the Australian airport uh, regulation. So basically, airport prices were set on a, a cost-based system, but then from 1997 to, uh, to 20, uh, 2002, the Australian government basically privatized a vast majority of, uh, of the airports. Uh, 11 out of 12 largest uh, airports, Sydney was excluded from that, had price caps basically, which allowed to pass through the necessary new investment uh, costs. And the price ca cap was meant to be a temporary measure which would need devaluation after a five-year uh, period. But then following a multi-stage process, the government actually decided to eliminate price control uh, and implement a system of price and quality monitoring, actually. And over, over time, we've seen that that brought, the removal of these price caps brought some, several, uh, some, some benefits, including an increased uh, a surge, actually, uh, given the time in, in investments. Uh, and two-thirds of the investments were actually focused on uh, aeronautical assets, uh, leading to, obviously, to growth in, in passenger and in demand. Once again, the direct, uh, let's say, applicability of this to electricity and gas is, is some, somewhat limited. But nevertheless, um, um, the potential to learn lessons uh, from the evolution of regulatory uh, aspects at airports under cert uncertainty, of course, uh, with strong cost-quality trade-offs is, is quite clear. And I'll uh, stop it here and I'll pass it to Professor Follett for the next section. Thanks, Andre. Great. Um, first of all, let me say how much I've enjoyed doing this project um, and with my two colleagues and with all the um, SARE members and sponsors of the project. Um, it's been great fun. Um, okay, so you know the challenge of net zero regulation of networks, uh, I think it does raise a governance challenge. Um, and I think one of the things that we discussed in the report is whether we're going to move towards a, some new governance arrangements where we have this tripartite uh, system um, in place where there might be some sort of independent um, system operator such as we've just seen emerging in, the, in Great Britain um, where the national uh, energy system operator is being set up to regulate um, via indicative planning, both uh, the electricity and the gas network, and that will work closely with the relevant ministry responsible for energy and climate change and with the uh, national uh, energy regulator. And they will different roles, um, and they will need to work together under the uncertainty of net zero. Um, so that brings us to our recommendations. Um, so we are saying... Well, I think the, the lovely thing, which I think the engagement process, um, uh, as we wrote the report, brought out, was that we wanted to recommend this learning concept for the regulator, a learning which uh, both looks backwards, learns in real time, and anticipates these future trigger points uh, and is more adaptive uh, into the future. Um, it is important to say that Looking across Europe, there's a wide variation in current regulatory practice, and clearly many European regulators can learn a lot from the leading regulators in Europe, um, of which I count Great Britain as one at the moment. Um, uh, but also uh, the Netherlands, Sweden have done some you know, forward thinking about how to regulate for net zero and whether their current system of regulation needs to change. Um, and uh, these uh, seven different things that the consultation process that we used uh, from Ofgem through up also give rise to very clear recommendations. That planning does need to be more forward-looking to have that sort of 25-year view that we've just heard about, not just be focused on the uh, current regulatory period. Um, there needs to be more use of uncertainty mechanisms. It's amazing that you know, many regulators don't have uncertainty mechanisms built into their regulatory process. It's such an obvious way to deal with uncertainty without an actual uh, formal need to, to renegotiate regulation. Um, 
Uh, regulatory incentives need to change. We, we, we keep hearing in the modelling that the things we need to do around hydrogen, biomethane, heat pumps, yet we don't have those things incorporated into most systems of regulation, system of incentives. Um, we, we, uh, one of the things that we discuss in the report is, you know, it can't be the case that the network users of an individual network are going to fund what's required to get to net zero at all times. We're going to have to think of combining network funding with some sort of taxpayer or general levy on all users in a, in a country uh, type of funding and getting, making sure that's non-distortionary and subject to the same, same incentives, that's going to be a regulatory challenge. Um, effective uh, stakeholder engagement, such as we heard with um, both the new reg regulation in, in Australia for energy, but also uh, in the airport examples, you know, stakeholder engagement can reduce the regulatory burden and result in better outcomes for both regulated companies and regulators, and we would definitely recommend that. And on innovation, I can't tell you the number of times I've met crazy innovators who think they know something about the energy sector, which they clearly don't, and they really need to talk to regulators about the fact your business model is never going to fly in its current form. Um, but, you know, it might fly uh, if you adapted it a little bit. Um, I think the industry governance piece is really interesting. Uh, you know, I think if we're serious about net zero, it raises all sorts of industry governance questions. You know, we know all countries in Europe have got an, an, an organisation of their electricity and gas sectors which was set up for a purpose. You know, it's organised in a particular way to deliver a particular set of outcomes um, and you know net zero may may require a change in the organization and changing the organization may make the incentive alignment for regulators much better and you only know, hear <clears throat> this is just a, a list of you know maybe not all countries need to do all these things some countries have already done some of them um, but we mentioned the separate system operator We've mentioned, you know, the, the, the need for perhaps new regional bodies in countries which have got very centralised uh, distribution systems which are not aligned with local government um, voting areas. Um, maybe we need to do stuff there. Um, maybe there's a reform of regulatory approaches moving to genuine ex-ante uh, adaptive regulation rather than relying on some ex-post settling up mechanisms which some countries rely on. Um, Asset reorganisation, perhaps to reorganise electricity and gas assets on the same geographic area. That, you know, that might make a lot of sense if you're trying to decarbonise both gas and electricity at the same time. Um, and then issues to do with who's responsible for these new networks. Um, and I know this is a very controversial thing to say. Um, uh, you know, maybe we need periods of public ownership. I mean, certainly we've had a long period of recommending private ownership, um, but, you know, the, the, the National Energy System Regulator is a public body in, in, in Great Britain. I hope it will be a success, um, but we'll see. Um, um, but, you know, comp genuine competition between public and private ownership is something that, at the margin, um, might, be, might be a good thing. And unbundling rules continue to be very restrictive towards net zero. You know, batteries will soon be a commodity technology. Um, the issue of why a, a network company cannot invest and run a battery to expand its network capacity is something that continues to be relevant and potentially should be on the table. Um, one of the things I think that we, we do try to make clear in the report, you know, not everything is for everyone at all times. Um, and also networks are different, um, but certain <coughs> things are important. The transmission distribution boundary is entirely arbitrary. It differs between countries across Europe in terms of voltage uh, levels and pressure levels, I imagine. Um, and, um, you know, we need to make sure there's no discriminatory uh, regulatory incentives between different levels of the network. Um, Gas networks require special treatment um, and you know, a lot of the uncertainty in future network regulation exists around the rate at which the gas network will decline or be transitioned over to biomethane or hydrogen. Um, and sorting that out 
uh, within regulation is something that is very important. And then the final thing, which we can all agree on, is if there is a need for a lot more investment, we need to speed up investment. You know, uh, getting regulatory approval in, in the widest sense for investment is still taking far too long across Europe, and that must be reduced if we're serious about meeting net zero targets. Um, and thank you all for listening. Sean, back to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much to the authors. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic piece, which I, I recommend uh, strongly uh, reading. Um, and uh, and it's, it's really launching a conversation. I don't think you're intending to be the final word on this at all, because this, this is itself going to be a dynamic process um, of figuring out what the right dynamic process is. <laughs> so, so, uh, so maybe I can in, uh, invite you to step down. We'll have questions uh, from the whole audience uh, uh, that can apply both to the panel and to you later. But first, we need to bring up the panel to have some, some feedback on what you said. Okay? So, panel, first panel members, if you could please come up and take a seat. Um, yeah, uh, just hand on down. Okay. Um, and so we've got uh, Mellis, Alessio, Ali, Gavin, and Klaus. I think it's, this is the way. There's no particular order necessary for the panelists, uh, but I will call on you uh, in the order I've got it written down in my papers. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to proceed in two parts with the uh, with panel, if we may. Uh, the first, I'm just going to ask for a quick reaction or a quick points that you might like to make on the topics we've just heard about. Um, and then I'm going to start peppering you with some questions. Then we'll open up to the audience for, uh, for questions for everybody, uh, both the panel and the authors, okay? So I'd like to actually uh, begin with Alessio um, and ask you for, for your quick comments. Okay. Thank you, for, sir, for inviting and uh, for uh, this interesting, such interesting report. I think that uh, regulation should be definitely in the center of our discussion, Greece regulation in particular, so I want to uh, say congrats for them and also to stress what also IEA is, good, is doing in this period to stress this importance. So last year we released our uh, first ever uh, report only dedicated to electricity grids where we highlight how the grids can be a bottleneck not keeping pace with the growth of the, of the renewables. Uh, in particular in clean energy technology, in fact, PV and solar in the last decade, they, they saw globally doubling their investment. Instead, grids stay stagnant in the same level, $300 billion globally. And so that, what does it mean? It means that we have very, very long connection queue from this project that we quantified in our estimation around uh, 1.5 terawatt. And we only estimated available information for the half of the worldwide market. So. It, will be, it could be very, very significant higher, and especially uh, in Europe. In Europe, where we have uh, a very long lead times, as mentioned by the colleagues from CERCIR, so we, we totally agree, and these times should be reduced, uh, because in advanced economies, in particular so in Europe, we have two, three times lead times than the emerging economy, such as India and, and China, for example. So to move on, we estimated that we need to uh, increase adding and replacing almost 80 million uh, kilometers of networks by 2030. That means obviously increasing investment. Increasing investment in the, in the next decade by uh, two times, so from 300 to 600 billion of dollar. Uh, and obviously, uh, considering a targeting net zero targets, this investment should rise to 1 trillion by 2030. So uh, what is necessary is obviously to uh, push the regulator that they don't have to should they don't have to act only reactively but proactively as mentioned so not with the uh, uh, standard regulation such as cost of service that tends to favor capex on opex and also reflecting in agar in agar uh, bill customer customer bill but also moving towards regulations such as the performance based where you can monitor performance and easily so in this way, 
uh, try to incentivize more innovative projects. Innovation is mentioned one of the same points and uh, digital resilience aspect of the networks. Okay, thank you very much, Alessio. Uh, so you've pre presented views that you've developed at the International Energy Agency. Uh, now we're going to uh, step over to, uh, to Melis Zikli, who's uh, the grid integration lead at Euroelectric. And uh, I'd like to hear your quick uh, thoughts on what we've Yeah, thank you. We're um, that's, that's, that's perfect because uh, we have this wonderful report from the IEA and uh, we uh, like the outcomes of it as we like the outcomes of uh, CER and we totally agree. So today as a representative of the uh, DSOs, um, I want to say that we also realize how incremental regulation is not uh, sufficient. We have a um, regulation today that is leaning towards uh, um, minimizing costs and maximizing the use of the existing infrastructure, and this will not be enough to uh, do the energy transition. What we need is an agile regulation, and when I say agile, it's a mix of everything you have presented at SIR. Um, and this um, agile regulation needs to help DSOs um, include the new investment needs, um, identify them, prioritize their investments, and basically go for the most um, uh, value-producing investments. And I can give just a few um, items on which uh, we are working uh, um, upon at uh, Euroelectric. We have identified, for instance, uh, the need to revise the remuneration framework at large. Let's take it, uh, you know, this topic very, very largely, and talk about, uh, for instance, the uh, recognition of OPEX equally uh, as CAPEX. This is something that you know should have happened a few years ago already, and we can see OPEX exploding and still not um, recognized. Um, at, at, at their real value for the for the society. A second point, and you might have seen our um, report that was published last week on NC battery investments. Basically, what we're saying is that we need a forward-looking mindset. And again, this is something that is lacking and that we urgently need today to have a decarbonized EU for uh, 2050. Another item that I can mention here is about uh, permitting. For instance, uh, um, you, you were saying that you know we're lacking uncertainty uh, mechanism, and maybe permitting is one of them because we haven't seen this uh, these huge queues, connection queues, uh, piling up in the EU. And today, it's very complicated to to build uh, the grid when we know that we need it, and that's very very surprising. Uh, we have been advocating a lot, for instance, uh, for the renewable energy direct to have a, a fast track approval or um, a renewable acceleration, uh, sorry, the renewable acceleration areas were something that were in the red already and we were pushing for grid acceleration areas. We cannot see the results yet and it shows that, you know, there's a lack of flexibility and agility in the way the law is conceived and in the way it is implemented. And maybe one last point is um, the way we maybe monitor the needs. It needs to be evolving. So we're not, um, we're, we need a regulation that allows us to reevaluate the needs of investments in time. And today we're um, impeded because the planning is not dynamic enough, so we will need some uh, regulations allowing us for more dynamic um, uh, planning, but also for a, a new um, approach on risk and efficiency assessment. Because again, risk and efficiency today are based on uh, cost reduction. One last thing to conclude is something that Sir has said, um, and I, I will say it uh, in my way, it is, there is no one size fits all. So we will definitely need the European framework allowing us to have more agility in the regulation, but we will need to adapt to the uh, specificities. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll hand over to Ali. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Ali Franz is the head of European associations at E.ON. Um, and let's, let's hear from you for a second about your thoughts on these matters. Thank you, Sean. So first of all, let, let me say that, that uh, Eon was very happy to, to 
uh, involve itself as, as also one of the parties who were financing this. Um, I'm very thankful to, to Daniel, Michael uh, and Andre because I believe the, the, the cooperation we had while doing this was really amicable and, and uh, discussions might not always have resolved themselves in total agreement, but at least we were having a very informed and, and academic discussion which I quite enjoyed because there's this little academic in me that sometimes just wants to play. Um, so thank you gentlemen, that was really, really nice and cool. So with regards to, to the project and, and its, its results, well, <clears throat> let me maybe say, start by saying that uh, from E.ON's point of view, and maybe also on E.ON's point of view, we are a grid operator in seven European countries. So we face seven national regulators uh, with their, let's say, dialects and, and their own way of, of going forward. Some of them, and we might come to that later, uh, are already moving. Some of them are rather reluctant to. Some of them are rather... Uh, how should I say, on a very short leash with their national government. Some of them are rather independent, and the works. You know that. Um, so what we have to say or, or find is really that today there are only a very few, I would even say none, regulatory systems that really can claim that they are already dynamic, responsive, and adaptive at the same time at least on the level that we would find necessary uh, to reach the decarbonization as fast as we are asked to do it. Um, so to give you one concrete example, maybe already now, so there is, you might be aware, a discussion on regulatory reform in Germany, and more or less the Bundesnetzagentur has been saying, well, we can have the discussion in the fourth period, and then in the fifth we are going to restart. And maybe that's just too late, to be frank. Um, and then, of course, there is always... Now, I have been a regulatory manager within the German system for more than 15 years, so if you want, my whole career. Um, and we have been saying stability, 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 stability. We need to be able to prognose what's going to happen, da 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 And that's, of course, true, because in the case of E.ON, there is a capital market that very closely watches what happens, and they have a very simple expectation, to be quite frank. You are investing, you being E.ON, and we see your EBITDA growing. That's a mechanism that a financial analyst can understand and comprehend. If that doesn't happen, then there's the question why. And that also shakes confidence. So um, we need a certain stability, but we need also to have, let's say, an ex-ante security that in certain, maybe even undescribable circumstances, something is going to change. And to give you a very concrete example where I have really have to praise all the NRAs that I or my colleagues were working with is losses in the energy crisis. Because losses costs, of course, were exploding. Uh, you could not leave that on the DSO balance sheet alone. Uh, and each and every nation found a reaction. Some of them, of course, had an easier stance of doing that. Uh, Swedish colleagues, if I'm not mistaken, could use some, some money that was generated by their um, congestion mechanism. Uh, other people had to find other monies, but, but it was rather clear that you could not leave the DSOs alone. And this is, I believe, the kind of security about an adjustment that should happen that we need. Um, learning regulator, and, and I might say Michael and I are not always of one opinion about institutional, let's say, uh, uh, innovation, but I believe the learning regulator is one that I could agree on, and, and E.ON could. Um, and that means continuous contact with stakeholders. And like Michael was correctly pointing out, also stakeholders that regulators don't regularly talk to right now. Uh, also much more contact to, to towns and municipalities than in the past because when the gas, and I was very thankful for you also bringing in actually a lot of information about the gas part, very readable, um, there is a certain dynamic um, and, and players are also involved on multiple levels. You might have a town that has a plan to decarbonize itself that also owns the district heating system. And so they're not entirely neutral but we are owning the distribution grid on electricity. We are not neutral either, to be very frank. Uh, but we would believe that there is one thing that we do know about the future. There will be an electricity grid, and this is why we would very much like to be part of the conversation on that part. And then maybe closing, um, and I've already mentioned it indirectly, planning locally and regionally um, and involving both DSOs, electricity and gas, is probably th something that we really ought to do. And I believe that that's planning is also a prime example, Mel has already mentioned it, of anticipatory investments. So if I know, like in the town of Essen where I live, that the district heating won't go 
south of A52, which is an autobahn which runs through the town, then I know, as the electricity operator for that town, that I have to have more load in the future in the south of Essen. So if I'm touching any kind of switching gear anyhow, there's probably a case for what we will call in an upcoming year electric report strategic upsizing. So really go for the next biggest unit, or maybe two bigger, just because I know for a fact that somewhere I'm going to need to be able to provide that capacity for the load that is going to come when heat decarbonizes. So maybe that one from my side. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now uh, let's hand over to Klaus. Uh, Klaus Hamas is, the, is a senior economist at EI. Um, and let's hear from you about your initial reactions. Yes, thank you very much. First, thank you for a great report. I've learned a lot by being involved, partly giving the opportunity to give some comments that you, part of them you even took up. <laughs> so I really liked the report and I learned quite a lot from about regulatory issues. And I think when I looked two years back, I was still at the energy agency, I was the chief economist there, and I looked over at the other guys higher up in the building. What are they doing? Is it so difficult to implement the working regulation, yes? And now I'm there and um, I understood it's not so easy to get a regulation in a stable environment working. Now we have an environment where things are happening quite fast, demands are rising. In Sweden, maybe it's not the decarbonization of the power system that is the driver, but the decarbonization of the industry, electrification of the industry, also in places where we didn't have uh, industry before, <laughs> like steel industry. Suddenly you have either 70 terawatt hours that will be used or not <laughs> somewhere in the north. So there's uh, lots of things that are happening that is uh, difficult to handle for both the TSO and for us. <laughs> so, but what I learned from the report is mostly two things. We are supposed to be both adaptive, responsive, and dynamic, all at the same time. And we try to manage to be at least a little bit dynamic <laughs> currently. <laughs> so learning about cost and getting a system right to implement, uh, to understand what the costs are, what the real costs are of the companies. And now we are trying to learn things also in real time and even forward looking, yeah? all that at the same time. And it's quite quite a challenge for, uh, for us without being, uh, uh, and at the same time, we are now currently, and that's why the paper comes quite in handy, in the process of uh, starting up the process for a new regulation for the next regulatory period, 2027 for gas and 28 for for electricity. So the report will be quite quite useful for that. But uh, when we look into the, the report, we always face the, also the trilemmas that you <laughs> painted up there, and that's one of them is that one with coherence is very important for us. We need to have things judged and say handled in the same things handled in the same way. We cannot give one person an exception for the system while somebody else doesn't get the exception. So we need to, to use, apply the law that is relevant to everybody in the same way. And that is also a difficult part of uh, being a regulator, so to say. We, we, we want to be agile, and we are. We have done a lot of things now, reducing processes, and we are no longer the most uh, the important hinder in the system. We make our decisions relatively well, uh, quickly now, but uh, still, there's so much that we need to handle. We need to take... Uh, we need to reflect the legal situation too, that is setting frame, a framework for what we can do. There are many things that can be done, non-firm uh, contracts, for example, or adaptive investment and, and so on. Yeah? So all these things, but in the end, when, we, when the things go wrong, they will be very costly for the consumers. <laughs> That's also one of our roles. So we are not only for driving the way to net zero, but we have also other responsibilities as a consumer, and we are working on, if you might not like it, but profit maximizing the monopolies <laughs> that might exploit their, their, their power or not. Yeah? We don't know, but we need to in some way handle them also, also consistently, yeah? so that consumers don't pay too much, but we want to make them keep the innovative streak 
develops the electricity net get a decent reward for what they're doing because they're worth money too. <laughs> of course, they're not uh, working for the out of the goodness of the, uh, their hearts either. Yeah? So, the, of course, they're driving a business, but it's an important business. We don't want to stand in the way, but we need to think about consumers too. That's also an important part of our work. But I think I'll stop here and give the okay, thank, microphone thank, to Jan. Thank you very much, Klaus. Now over to Gavin for some initial thoughts. Thanks very much, <clears throat> and thanks very much to the authors um, and for kind words about our Rio system. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, we've, we've very much enjoyed contributing to the report and learning a lot about how our regulation compares to others um, across, across Europe and beyond. So I was just going to talk for a few minutes about, well, not very many minutes, about what we've learned so far since we've been doing Rio um, and the in interactions with um, the form of regulation you might need for net zero. All right. So Rio, for those who don't know it, I mean, I think it probably reasonably well fits within the definitions of dynamic regulation. It is quite focused in a lot of ways on learning from the past. We have quite, we have a lot, wide range of mechanisms, all which could be looked at as trying to learn from past experience and trying to make outcomes of regulation better. We have a lot of outputs where we found that um, the um, networks were not necessarily delivering fully on outputs, and we also have a lot of uncertainty mechanisms to allow um, changes to the form of regulation where necessary during the period where new information arises. For, uh, uh, sorry, Gavin. Yeah. I, I should introduce you properly. So you're a chief economist at the UK regulator Ofgem, and Rio means for those for those who it's, are um, not it, from the UK. It's incentives, innovation, and outputs for the IIO. I think it's return. I think is the R, isn't it? Thank you, Tim. <laughs> I'm so used to applying it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's right. And effectively, the so the incentives very much around just creating better outcomes where we found that outcomes weren't working quite well. Innovation is interesting because I think after 20 years across multiple regulated sectors, you could just see the private regulated companies that we have in the UK. You know, they didn't innovate, and you could argue that they didn't have the incentive to do so. It would almost be against their shareholders' interests. So we have created various innovation frameworks. So those are the three things that have changed. And generally, you know, you might say that it seems to be working reasonably well. But at the same time, it's sort of been a big journey. And you might argue that we're at the top of a bit of a hill of regulation. If you see our documents, they Rio 2 documents were like many thousands of pages. And hence kind of why when we're looking at the net zero challenges and the fact that the world is going to be a bit different, I think we do think we probably need to come over the hill a bit and actually try and simplify and really focus on what matters for the next stage of regulation. And as was said in the intro, we did, and I was sort of joint led a review as to whether actually we should just rip it all up and start again because of net zero. And I think what we concluded was that actually the right approach was to adapt and I think to, you know, to move more towards what probably is that kind of forward-looking adaptive regulation, but maintaining the stability that does, is really important to investors and to companies to have a sense of what they're going to get. So, so we do think regulation needs to change. And I think I'd probably say, sort of stepping back a bit, is because... You know, what consumers need is just going to be different over these next sort of two, three regulatory periods. In the past, it's maybe been keeping the lights on, keeping the heating on at lowest cost, at most efficient cost. Now, there's two other big dimensions to network regulation. One is just delivery of net zero, delivery of all the investments needed, the best value investments for transition. And the other is just being part of an energy system. So it's not just about regulating the individual company and them doing the best for themselves, for consumers, but they are part of a system and needs to work together. And I think, you know, I think my views echo a lot of what's been said on the panel already in terms of the importance. You know, we've sort of started with transi transmission now, but we're very much at the early stage of thinking about distribution as well, and it's likely to need to follow. So. Um, happy to discuss further um, our approach to regulation. Great. Uh, okay. Panel. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn now uh, for a quick question to uh, Melis, 
so the, uh, uh, we haven't spoken that much about digitalization of networks and uh, regarding DSO digitalization, I think your organization is drafting a report um, and I just wondered if you could uh, comment on, on the need for agile regulation uh, within the context of what you're uh, writing about now. Yes, uh, thanks for bringing that up because uh, digitalization is one aspect of um, the networks that um, is not forgotten, but you know, we're talking about all these investments that we need to expand the grid, and one shouldn't forget how uh, smartening of the grid is important. Um, and I have heard um, in, in the discussions, I've heard very interesting things, and one of them was, um, okay, so um, we also need to guarantee that the customer is not, um, you know, losing, I mean, it, it can be losses on, on many levels, but for instance, financial uh, level is an interesting uh, thing to, to, to consider. Um, and for that, what we say is that um, to digitalize the grid, we need to have more regulatory sandboxes just to have, you know, a phase where we measure what the benefits could be. And um, we, we believe in these benefits, but we also uh, need to take care about the fact that these regulatory sandboxes should be limited in time. So basically, you know, to always have this ass assessment of what do we uh, invest? What do we get as an, uh, and as I was saying, efficiency is not only about cost, so what do we get as an efficiency? Uh, how do we evaluate efficiency in this uh, smartening of the grid? Um, so this is one thing, regulatory sandboxes uh, that then need implementation. Another thing is access to funding, because right now what we see is that DSOs have very uh, difficult access to EU fundings in the sense that um, uh, the rules are not uh, very clear. Also, um, DSOs haven't always been, you know, at the forefront of, of the investment needs. So we are asking for a re-evaluation of all these, um, all these rules. And just one last point is um, when we talk about the digitalization, we shouldn't forget about uh, cyber threats. We need a resilient grid, so we also need an um, adaptive regulation um, towards the, the, the cyber threats that are coming in that are evolving uh, so fast. Okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, and now over to Ali. Um, uh, so I think Eon is operating grids in seven European countries, so this, this is quite a variety of experience that you have. And I wonder what your impressions are of how the regulatory authorities are reacting to the new challenges that are arising so far. Thank you for the question. Um, well, of course, the, the, the experience is vast and, and different. And uh, I, I mentioned the German example already. Uh, by the way, the, the, the main innovation that the Bundesnetzagentur is proposing is to shorten the regulatory period to three years now. Um, First and foremost, that doesn't really make the time lag in OPEX go away, really, if you think about it. Um, and secondly, while we might agree that that is an idea for gas, because gas is really going to evolve in a, in a trickle-down fashion, I believe, in certain cases, uh, I don't think it's a very good idea for electricity. Um, then on the other hand, um, and you might not think that that's the case, but if you look to our Czech colleagues, they, they have a mechanism in place that, that technically I would describe as a sort of sliding scale for OPEX. So they really look at certain types of OPEX and you always have this discussion then on positive lists and what's on the list and what's not and whether you can label it differently and blah, blah. But generally speaking, the regulator recognizes that the OPEX are rising. And then he says, okay, we look at all of them. And if you're going up, I'm going to go up with you, but not for 100%, because there needs to be a certain efficiency target that you still have. And on the other way around, if they're going down, you may keep part of that so that you have an incentive to really save on OPEX still. Now, I like the mechanism because I believe it's intelligent. And if you only have, like, I always tend to forget four or five DSOs in Czechia, then of course you can do that. Um, <laughs> if you consider Germany and whatever, how many hundred, uh, you know the famous number, then that, of course, is a transaction cost challenge, as, as Daniel was, was pointing out. Um, and, and then maybe finally, um, the, the general perception of the investment, and, and maybe I, I, I may jump from an E.ON niche regulator to an international one, namely Acer. Um, I, I only looked at the DARE and, and uh, CER's report very quickly, 
And I read the sentence that says, anticipatory investments are not treated differently from any other investments. And I couldn't agree more. But what they don't see is the problem that lies in that. Because if you happen to operate under a TOTEX regime that includes an efficiency benchmark, and for my kind of money, the one doesn't work without the other, then you might actually be punished for anticipatory investment behavior because you have the cost, but you don't have the structural factor to explain it already. And for my kind of money, there might be an easy solution to that, and that is just to delay the benchmark to the next period for the new investment. But that is, of course, uh, a price that consumers might be unwilling to pay. But still, we need to find a way to cope with that, because the risk that I'm actually punished in the benchmark, if I operate under TOTEX, is high. Um, and it is also perceived to be high by, the, by, by our directors already now. So they call, really call me and say, yeah, but if I'm going to do that, <laughs> I'm going to create a problem for Eon. <laughs> and we are going, wait, <laughs> we're going to solve the problem first, and then we're going to start into this anticipatory stuff, because we really believe that it is necessitated by the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think the, the risk of punishment of anticipatory investment is really a serious risk, especially in the context of what Alessio was saying about, effectively, he was saying that investment in the grid needs to triple uh, very quickly. Um, and so, uh, so any kind of threat of punishment uh, for, for moving quickly uh, leads to a very natural business response, which is to move slowly. And that's not necessarily what we want. So, Alessio, I wonder, if, uh, if you could quickly comment on what you see as some of the main challenges for electricity grids coming up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, considering what they already told, anyway, we have grid planning. There should be for sure one challenge because we have to consider them in a coordinated way between TSO and DSO, but also including long-term scenario development with uh, that reflects climate goals and also including uh, flexibility solution as alternative to network reinforcement as we for example, we already we are seeing in UK uh, and other stuff that could be surely uh, stressed more is the reduction of lead times, so streamlining the processes, especially in you for reduction for the reduction of connection queue, um, performance-based regulation, anticipatory investments already already put in place, and the last one that I want to stress is the resilience of supply chain because uh, everything is going in a uh, in direction to increase grid investment but we should have a supply chain that should be ready in terms of delivery of material and component. And so uh, clear grid project pipeline should be put in place very quickly to avoid uh, further problems also in supply chain. Okay, thank you. Uh, now uh, we'll go to Gra Gavin uh, quickly. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a provocative question. So, so what is and, and isn't working well with this Rio framework. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I guess I might comment on the last couple of comments and then you can see what you think about it as an answer. So, so on transmission, um, we have effectively, I mean, within the Rio framework, we've effectively kind of reopened the electricity transmission um, price control mid-period to effectively allow for anticipatory investment. We had a strategic plan from the system operator. It said there was a lot of new investment needed. I imagine everybody knows about the supply chain constraints and also the fact that we had a five-year period and which had just started until the next review. And although we had uncertainty mechanisms designed to allow for investment, we actually thought you know, although they're there, we can see they probably need to work a bit more quickly. So we even changed the uncertainty mechanisms. There was uncertainty about how they would work. And so we, we made them work more quickly. And, and I think that's sort of a good example of the kind of adaptive approach where we've looked forward and seen, well, there is nothing to be gained for consumers by following the process that's going to take two, three, four years. It might have some cost benefits, but actually... You know, even if it does, then the costs, when you look at the impact on just getting the system built a lot less slowly, are going to be much higher. And we think that's the kind of new trade-off that we need to look at. 
in distribution. I think we're probably not there yet, and I think the discussion, well, there's a debate about whether we're there yet. So effectively, we've just started the current control. We have volume drivers, which are designed to allow for the kind of anticipatory investment that has been discussed. But there is a big debate in the sector about whether they are flexible enough and whether they are too restrictive in defining under what circumstances you can build new investment during the period that wasn't in the baseline and actually how they work alongside the incentives. And I think that's probably an area for the next development is how we get that kind of reactive regulation that we've now got in transmission, but where there's a smaller set of projects, so it's a bit easier, into something that works for distribution, where there's going to be a bigger set of projects, they're all going to be smaller, the risk on each project might be a lot smaller, but nevertheless, you know, we won't have time to look at each of all of them, so we'll need something slightly different. So I think, you know, I think probably the discussion has highlighted some of the challenges going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now over to Klaus. Um, this is the, uh, the golden question here. Is there anything you can think of that's missing in the report? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, the, the report is perfect as it is. <laughs> but as, 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 yeah, as three researchers sitting there, you always find something new that you can look into. And I think the report is, has started, has opened the box, but there's still things that you can look into further. And I think one aspect is what I've talked about a little bit, the effects on consumers, for example, that are not really reflected in the report as it is currently. But of course, you cannot do everything in one report. But things trade, also when you have those trade-offs between dynamic and adaptive and so on, regulation in some way, yes, you have effects on consumers in one way or another. And you might also have a dynamic effect you know, look into what you, you were talking about might become something might become cheaper, more expensive for the, for the consumer now, but in the long run it might become cheaper. So you, the, the trade-offs are interesting. I do not say that anticipatory investments are a case of that one, but it might be and other things. So you have to look into how things develop over time and how they affect consumers and because that's in some ways they, they are the ones that in the end pay, and if you look at dif to different groups of consumers, it's not only household consumers like me, but it's also industries that are struggling if pr costs can become too, get too high, or if they have to carry to a high cost in the short run, then they will simply move somewhere else, and then we have a competitiv competitiveness problem in, in Europe, but then they are not, are not there to, wait, to experience the long run when everything becomes cheaper. <laughs> So to say, I think that's that's important to see and look into those trade-offs from the consumer perspective. And the other thing is also that what is here not so deeply, or not at all included, but I think some of the legal environments, rules, rules that what is allowed, what can we do as a regulator within the system, and what, how has the system as a legal system be, uh, to be adapt, adapted and developed to reflect exactly what you, you are talking about. It's not only we that m need to be more dynamic, uh, that adaptive, and so also the legal system needs to be, be part, is part of that because we as regulators are, are move, we are exist, existing in that system. Huh? So the two parts, and then of course you also finally need to convince the lawyers to understand what we regulators are doing. <laughs> so they say, stop, <laughs> let us do our job. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you so much. So, oh, we'll just uh, maybe, uh, oh yeah, please, Klaus. Uh, Ali. It's really important. So, so Gavin, it, it, I'm paraphrasing now, what you just said, and I couldn't agree more, is that you, we need also to look at the counterfactuals so, so the question needs to be, what will happen if we don't do it? And I believe that is probably the innovation that we need also in the planning cycle, because right now, more or less, the question is being asked, okay, we need to transport, at least on the German TYNDP, on the TSO level, we need to transport these many GWH of offshore electricity southward. What do you need as an asset to do that? Okay. The question that is not really asked or at least the result is not shown in the report, and it is not asked definitely on a DSO plan level today, what happens if you don't do it? Because that might as well prove to be very costly, and then I couldn't agree more with Klaus that, that maybe we have to look at the question, uh, 
one in a spatial sense, the consumers that then need to pay for that, the right ones, and also in a generational sense. Is this generation the one that's supposed to be paying for that? You might say, yeah, they had the benefit <laughs> of producing too much CO2, uh, but you might also say there is a generation coming up um, that, that also has a benefit and, and they might also be, be asked to pay. So um, I believe counterfactuals is actually an information that, that is really missing in the debate and, and that we should also start to concentrate upon. Thank you for, for allowing me to do okay, that. Okay, thank, thanks, Ali. Um, now we're going to open up the floor for a, a short Q&A. Uh, so any, any questions? Uh, yes, so we... Second row, please. She's on her way. Okay. <laughs> Two. And, and, then, uh, and then we'll take the second question in the back. Yes. Yes. I did not have the opportunity to read the report. Okay. And if you could identify yourself. Okay, my name is Teresa. I run a center uh, for regulation and infrastructure. Unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity of reading the report yet. Question that I have, we have a change in landscape. It's not only, uh, so we are going from a trade-off between rent and efficiency in the economic regulation to another one in which regulators uh, have to pave the way for a net zero world in which uh, there must be also the delivery of inclusiveness, equity, and also resilience. It poses several challenges. And also regulators have become increasingly accountable by policymakers and by consumers, as was mentioned here. So the question is, does the report address this, this aspect? And also, uh, what about the ability or the need for regulators to improve their capabilities in terms of data and analytics, the information that is coming from the regulatory sandboxes, uh, information coming from digitization of networks? How can regulators react, adapt their tools then to prove or to bring evidence on the need to invest further in the grid that we need? Okay, thank you. And there was a question far in the back there. Yeah. If you could identify yourself, please. Sure, thank you very much for your interesting debate. Jakub Glaszkowski, PGE. I would like to ask you about the financial side. You've mentioned briefly uh, that we cannot put everything on the tariff side. Uh, what we are uh, hearing from the European Commission is that there is shortage of public money and we should not expect, for example, from, for, from the next multi-annual financial framework to support uh, with subsidies, development of grids. Uh, so I'm wondering to what extent you can imagine in, um, further involvement, involvement of private money uh, through public money in, in incentivizing uh, access to, to private money. To what extent can electricity grids distribution or transmission be financed or co-financed by private money? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we could then start with an answer from the report team for the first question. Um, uh, thank you. Um, um, okay, um, one of the, um, I put up the chart on the uh, future system governance. I think the reason why we advocate this three-part, that's tripartite system, is precisely because you need to involve the political process in regulation. So, um, you know, one, the ministry was in there, as well as the NRA, as well as the future system operator. I think one of the issues that you you face going forward with the net zero is you have to have political support for costly uh, network expansions. And I think getting that, so we, we do expressly address that while we're also raising the issue in the report of have we got regulatory alignment between political entities and the network companies um, uh, and yeah that's absolutely essential I think for net zero um, uh, the other question which you asked well how do you learn as a regulator and again that's something I think that we, we discussed in uh, in the process of the report something I think Klaus you were pushing us on you know how do I actually learn um, and I think that is about the stakeholder engagement, isn't it? And which again, part of the stakeholder engagement is with consumers, it's with uh, the political process, and it is with 
um, you know, the industry in the widest sense. So yes, we do discuss that, and, and that you know there is there's a lot of wisdom in this in the stakeholder engagement. I, I think that the, the the next question was on the public private money thing, and again, you know, this is again something that came out in the discussion and is in the report that in future you cannot expect, especially if demand continues to decline in certain parts of the network, uh, you cannot expect you network users to fully finance the transition. You have to have a combination of public money, whatever that is. It could be a levy uh, on all consumers. It could be a gas electricity levy to pay for hydrogen or whatever to, to, to maintain the resilience of the network. Again, we raise all these issues in the report um, and, and in response to. I think uh, the question, no, rather naughty question you asked, Clarice, about have we, have we answered everything? No, of course not. And we'd love to do a follow-up report to catch all the, uh, the things that we haven't answered. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Ali, please. Um, so, so I'm not so sure that I'm so pessimistic as you are. Um, because there, there is a bit of talk in town on, on what is, I believe, called the decentralized grid facility. So I believe that the, the idea is resonating with certain officials of the commission that what we have right now, namely the PCI program in the end, um, is by its nature not really open to everybody. It's, it's the usual dilemma. Uh, you, you keep saying in Brussels that you want to work for SMEs and then you look at the form and go, no. Um, and we're not an SME, so we are able to tap into that. Um, and secondly, I believe there's also this Let's see at least question whether everything that was allocated to the modernization fund, for instance, is being used by member states, especially the ones that claim that they have major uh, congestion in their grid in a wise way. Of course, building a high voltage line doesn't really create votes, <laughs> and there might be a, a problem of political economy, but I would suggest that this whole question of funding is one where we might not see only implementation, but rather innovation. Um, and of course, Eon is, is very uh, keen on, on having that discussion. I know that Edzo has also been, been working on that uh, quite extensively, as Charles is sitting here in the front row. Um, so I believe there is a debate, and, 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 and also I believe the debate to, to be timely. And if I may have one more, um, especially with the anticipatory investment, you immediately have, in the end, probably an affordability question. And especially that case of affordability question might be solved by, by public money, like I said before, because you really have this question, are the right users uh, being asked to pay for that, or, or should we have a broader, however that works, Michael was elaborating on that a bit, should we have a broader base of, of, of payees in the end? Okay, I think uh, Gavin I just wants to make a quick comment, please. Yeah, I just thought the, there was a comment about... Um, Part of the question was around equity and inclusivity and how the funding of the network is going to um, benefit all consumers. And I mean, it is, it is early stage and it is hard to tell exactly what's going to happen, but what's going to happen is that the costs and benefits that are, of the system are going to change. And whilst there's going to be all this investment needed for the network, and that's going to increase the sort of fixed cost of running the network, the variable cost of operating the network is likely to come down, and that's going to probably also Im mean less investment in some of the um, technologies which are being replaced. So what is going to change is the balance between costs, and certainly we as regulators and the other parts of the trilemma need to think about yeah. in enough time how that rebalancing works to make sure that everyone benefits equally. But I don't think there's a default position that actually the transition doesn't need to be equitable. And of course, that's before we allow for all the non-financial benefits that will come from the taking carbon out of the system, which should also benefit um, people more broadly. Okay, uh, quick question for the panel. Any, any compelling need to make a, a final comment from anyone? <laughs> um, uh, now, the authors, you get the last word, I think. I, I, I have to praise Michael. I have to praise Michael once more because I really believe that the part on frank and firm feedback is really important uh, because that's really what's lacking sometimes. Um, it would also help us tremendously because we are probably telling the same answer that you are telling and, and then 
we are perceived as just trying to keep somebody <laughs> out of the market. Uh, so, so yes, I, I totally, that, that's one that I really liked because I believe that that's also a function that the regulators really have to take, namely to say, this works, this is not going to work, or only if, um, because that, that would help us tremendously. And we love innovation, we love technology, but sometimes if you try to build a model that just doesn't have a balanced group, it's not working in this market, quite frankly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any last word? No. No? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for for the chance to just to say the last words. Well, they're not the last words. <laughs> you'll, you'll keep hearing from us, that's, uh, that's for sure. But I just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for all the insightful comments that, that, uh, and, and all the engagement we've had with, uh, with many of you uh, writing this, uh, this report. Um, we, we are uh, learning even today, uh, and probably uh, the conversation we're having right now is the basis of our next report, um, uh, keeping the, the, the consumer in mind and thinking more about uh, the, uh, the consumer, also the financing aspects and funding, the role of the private sector, new instruments and so on. So th this really has been a rich conversation. We, we are really grateful and yeah. Th 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 and thank, thank you very thank much. You so much. We're gonna, therefore, uh, just a, a quick round of applause for the panelists and the authors. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, in 2023, it was 2 billion euros. And we think from, to, uh, from now to 2030, uh, 2040, sorry, 2040 uh, in 15 years, we will increase about 100 billion euros. It's very, uh, it's not, not the same perspective than before. So we need some resources. We need some internal resources to manage the project of investment. We need some external resources uh, with uh, supply chain. Supply chain because uh, there are some shortage, some difficulty to, to get all the raw material we, we need. Uh, and it's uh, uh, also a huge challenge about financing and about tariff acceptability. Financing because we have to finance more and more, and we cannot, uh, as in the past, to say we just increase the debt, and uh, we we have to to find other source of financing. And another point important in the past, we got some grants from European Union, and we think that this grant will decrease in the future. And that, that, that if, if there there are there are not in the scale of uh, what is uh, ne necessary for. Uh, for the financing of the, of the network. Max, thank you. You're mm. touching on a number of important subjects here, which we will uh, discuss. Mm. Maybe, Charles, do you want to add from a distribution perspective? Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, indeed, it's uh, coming in the second panel, I have to say, is a bit difficult because a lot of the things that I thought about saying were already been said. But uh, I think it's important to say that uh, when you're thinking about regulation and, and changes. I mean, that the, that the electricity distribution system operator is, is, is not the same, in many ways, not the same business that it was 20 years ago. And so it's natural to think that regulation needs to move on to, if it's regulating a, a business that's quite different. And of course, as I think most people in this room are quite aware of the kind of differences that, that the business is right now and that in terms of the amount of distributed generation that's on the, on the distribution grid, which of course was, it was a one way uh, kind of uh, grid uh, from the transmission to the distribution to the to the householder business is, is that's just not true, um, but there, it's not only that it's it's also that, that the amount of digitalization um, it's it's dealing with uh, uh, not only distributed generation but uh, also uh, smarter appliances electric vehicles uh, heat pumps etc all these things that, that that I think people in this room are, are quite aware of and so um, a regulation that that uh, that was designed for a time of of uh, of a very straightforward kind of system to a, a much more complicated system seems to me not uh, needs to be rethought. Uh, and I, I come from a regulatory background. I, to be clear, I don't speak for regulators today uh, in any way. But uh, I, I mean, regulators are rightly concerned about about the, the cost for the consumer. I don't think any distribution system operator will say, "Ah, the, con the uh, it doesn't matter how much it costs for the consumer. We just we just want to do this because it's uh, it's fun and interesting and innovative." Um, you know, uh, we we want to get to net zero. I mean, uh, and. Uh, I, I think Oliver mentioned that the, the, the counterfactual, and, and I was I was thinking about that as well, because it's it's do you want it, it's if we have these short regulatory periods, and you're thinking about not only uh, about uh, costs that may be passed on later because you're not taking to them count and taking them into account now, yet you still need to reach these decarbonization goals, but you also need to think about savings that might not come until 10 years later because of the investments that you're making now. And so I think a, a regulation that, that really starts to take all that into account will be a regulation that, that gets us to where we need to go. Um, one last thing I would say too is one other difference that I, I didn't really hear mentioned is that it's not only about decarbonization to, to avoid climate change, but that there already is climate change. And so the grid operators are already facing resilience issues now, and that also needs to be taken into account. Max, what's your take on handling the consumer costs? I'm sure RTE doesn't want to be the ones who have to <laughs> explain that tariffs are going to double or triple. Uh, yes, the, the, the point is that uh, the costs are increasing, but also the demand is increasing because we think we will have uh, in, we will increase of 50 percent the consumption. But it's not the case now. Now, in 2023, uh, the consumption is uh, stable or a little bit decreasing. We, we think in the future, and. Uh, 
uh, we think that, that that's a, an important point because if we don't have this increasing of consumption, it, need, it means that all the cost we are we have we, will be supported by uh, the actual uh, consumption, and, and so it will be difficult. But uh, people have to be uh, have to have in mind that the energy price will be higher in the future than than now. Uh, and uh, the, the, the network price, the network component is not the component that increases the, the, the most compared to other components as uh, uh, generation. For example, in, if we replace fossil fuel by uh, renewable, it will be more expensive and we will need more flexibility. It will be uh, more expensive. We just have to don't have to compare only the cost of the generation, but also the, also the flexibility you need when you replace uh, gas uh, plant by uh, uh, renewable wind or uh, solar. Uh, we think we will have also nuclear, but uh, nuclear uh, used to be at low cost uh, energy, but uh, in the future with new nuclear, we don't know what will be the price, but uh, we are sure it will be much more higher than now. Uh, uh, the, 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 the historic uh, nuclear power, point, power plants of, uh, in France uh, are uh, the price about 50 euro by megawatt hour. And I think it will, for the future, it will be twice or three, maybe three times the, the, this cost. So uh, obviously the consumer will have to pay. It's a very bad news for the consumer. And uh, but may, maybe uh, we have difficulty to tell him. Uh, uh, I, I am not sure that, uh, for example, all the regulators are convinced that they will have a very high increase of price. We, we see already that in Germany or in Belgium, the grid tariff have increased a lot. Uh, about 100% uh, of increase, uh, very high increase. Uh, in France, it's qu quite more difficult because in France we have a lot of uh, consumer with uh, uh, space heater with electricity in uh, with uh, sometimes low quality of space heater in with uh, low uh, insulation, in, and uh, so it's a, a social problem to increase the price of electricity. Against that backdrop, I imagine it will be even more difficult to discuss the innovation budget. I understand RTE already has quite a sizable budget and wants to increase it. Mm. Um, maybe what, what do you think will this uh, discussion with the regular, re regulator will look like? I, I know the authors are thinking about an innovation, dynamic innovation-led efficiency. So what does that mean for you both? Um, yes, uh, uh, RTE is quite lucky because we have a, a, a good budget for uh, research and development, but 1% of revenue. We expect to have 1.5, maybe if uh, the regulator agree. And we want to have this, uh, this uh, expense with uh, high uh, TRL, technology readiness level, uh, to, to be a very operational expense for, for improving, for example, IT system or, or so on. Uh, and we think that innovation can be a key for uh, reduce cost. If we, if we have uh, uh, more need, you can decide to increase line overhead lines cable as before, but we can say uh, we can better use what we have with uh, uh, the IT system. Uh, and uh, innovation can be the key to, to, to lower cost for uh, consumers. I mean, one thing that's perhaps different from the, from TSOs as DSOs is, is, that, is that, of course, the wide diversity. And and when you, I mean, when EDSO represents large and some medium-sized uh, electricity electricity distribution officers. But uh, when you have smaller DSOs, the kind of uh, innovation that that they're going to be able to do, uh, I don't know, a DSO, let's say, with 150,000 customers. Uh, I mean, they're. Th to expect them independently to be doing uh, interesting, uh, cutting-edge innovation is not uh, realistic. So um, I think that uh, we need to think about innovation on the distribution grid not as a 
uh, DSO by DSO matter. It's true that some DSOs and some of our members uh, are doing very innovative things. Uh, uh, just surprisingly, it, it, I'm still surprised by some of the things that our, our members are able to do. But they tend to be be quite lar larger ones that are are perhaps more, with budgets more comparable to a TSO. But uh, I, I think that's that's one challenge on, on innovation. But uh, there's a need for innovation funding that uh, is not coming directly from from grid tariffs and. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, as well, uh, basic re research and development funding, these kinds of fundings, also associations play a role in innovation. Um, big in terms of t technology, knowledge sharing, we have committees that do that. Um, so I think that the role of associations there is important. Um, yeah, and I, I would say too that uh, when it comes to European funding, getting back to that point, I think it needs to be said too that uh, the regulatory frameworks in Europe are not all uh, equally adapted to actually DSOs t using European funding. So you have, a, and think about that, that's actually kind of a, a political issue if you think about it, because uh, if the EU is, 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 is appropriating funding that should be able to be used equally by any, any DSO or TSO, but in fact the member states regulatory framework doesn't, doesn't make, doesn't incentivize that, and another um, uh, member state's regulatory framework does, then, then in fact, European funds are being steered to, to DSOs and TSOs, not according to uh, the parameters of the European funding, but by simply by, because of the regulatory framework in that particular member state. And that's, 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 not, a, that's not an ideal situation, certainly something that needs to be fixed. Yeah, thank you for pointing at the large diversity of regulatory systems in Europe. Um, perhaps something that came up in the previous panel was also the necessity of working closer together between TSOs and DSOs. Uh, what's your perspective on that? Um, yes. Uh, can you, can, can you uh, present Maybe, uh, uh, yeah, I was thinking of asking Charles oh, what, what uh, challenges mm. you see but, mm. uh, in, in that collaboration, but perhaps, mm. um, Max, you can also mm. uh, say how, how this is going to pan out uh, in the future. I know how, how grid planning is being done traditionally. It's mm. very much in-house, and, and then you, you, know, you go to the regulator. But mm. in the future, there will have to be a lot more collaboration. Yes, but what is changing about grid planning is uh, that uh, we, we, we do grid planning in the very long run, uh, n not only for the next uh, five or ten years, but we go uh, very, very far in the, in the future. Uh, and uh, 2040, but we have, we, we have some studies also for what will happen in 2050. Uh, and, and we, we need to, to see uh, very, very further because there are huge investment and what is difficult is to have, to have a, uh, 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 planning in for many years, but we, have, we must have dynamic planning because things can change, we have many uncertainties and we are not sure that everything will be useful. And we have a debate about anticipatory investments. Uh, anticipatory investment has to be uh, covered by the regulator uh, and not uh, penalized, but it can be stranded cost possibly in the future. But uh, if the regulator does not, does not accept anticipatory investment, it can be uh, more expensive in the future. A couple of things. I mean, for, what, for, one, for one thing, of course, in the clean energy package, it requires that that the network development plans of DSOs take into take into account explicitly and work with it to do with on those plans in cooperation, close collaboration with the TSOs. Now, of course, uh, it, it may be that in some member states that, that that's not uh, fully implemented yet, and and, and that that's an, an issue, of course, always. But and also that uh, again, some smaller DSOs may be exempted from that. Um, or they are exempted from that under 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 European legislation, uh, but I think there are good examples. I mean, there's a, there was a project in the Netherlands that uh, one of our members did that where, where the TSO where they they, they worked to create a kind of uh, uh, integrated flexibility uh, marketplace, if you will. They're not exactly it's not exactly a, a something like a flexibility provider per se, but it's more of a, a structure for them to to use each other's flexibility. These kinds of projects, I think we need more and more of those, and, and, and that, I think that's, that's one of the ways forward. 
Uh, is there maybe one of the authors who wants to react, uh, or are there any questions from the audience? None for now? Okay, I think it's, it's been also a long discussion. <laughs> let me thank you uh, very much, and let me also um, say that, I mean, if any, this, this uh, discussion has shown us um, it is a very complex matter. Uh, it will require a lot of focus uh, going forward, and um, I think um, Gavin, not you, you uh, pointed at that, and then uh, Michael said very pointingly that uh, when there's a need for more investment, it just needs to be done. So I wanted to pick that up. And uh, Daniel, you said in your introductory remarks that uh, regulation is an art. Um, I think uh, we did get a sense today uh, about that, and, and I would like to thank the authors of this study for uh, giving us some really concrete ideas of um, you know, how regulation has to evolve um, to achieve the decarbonization agenda of Europe. Um, so thank you to Michael Pollitt, Andre Kovatariu, and Dania Duma for this study. Thank you very much uh, to Max Papon from RTU and uh, to Oliver Franz from E.ON and uh, Dr. Oliver Franz and Gavin Knott from Ofgem, Klaus Hamnes from, from the Swedish regulator for their really helpful input and all the many stakeholders who have contributed to the study. Um, I'd also like to thank a very patient and interested audience uh, for uh, you know sitting through a very long discussion on regulation. Um, and note that uh, the discussion will be found on the SER YouTube channel as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the authors also.